stand up. Um, I'm also going to invite anyone who wants to to move closer. Not just stand But uh, we're going to have a good time this morning. Let's uh, let's sing together. This is my desire to honor you, Lord, with all my heart. I worship Boxes 
as you're going out the back doors of the movie video that is your way to do that. You'll also notice the time that most of the young people get up and leave. Uh, that's not because the Pied Pipers walk through. That's because it's time for upstream worship. That's for um, uh, grades kindergarten through fifth grade. And so the young people will be leaving for that. Um, and so, uh, you'll be standing again as usual. All right, please stand and let's continue worship. Let's all sing together. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name.
But I kind of started liking this one cook on there, and started really getting interested in it. His name was Alton Brown. He did a lot of, had a show called Good Eats, and he uh, kind of based his show around one dish, and then he would talk about the science of, of cooking that food and what happens to it, and it's really interesting. I saw an interview earlier in this week that he did, and he talked about the five most important tools in his kitchen. Of course, the first one was a good knife, sharp or dull, you know, whatever you like to use. A good spoon, if anything, just for a, a mental connection with your food. Light, of course, you need light to see what you're cooking. And fire, of course, uh, you need induction to actually cook the food. Does anyone know what, what I mean, what, what would you think that would be the last one? He said the most important one. What would be the most important tool in your kitchen? I had to think about it. Salt. You put salt in almost everything in the soup. Church, oh, sermon, Jesus. And he said, it's the kitchen table. Because if there's no kitchen table to break bread at, then there's no point in cooking at all. Hmm. And we gather around this table, the most important table, I would say. And we get to break bread and we share wine in remembrance of Jesus who did the same thing with the sinful, with the broken, and with people just like us. I think coming to the table and communing with one another is such an important part of doing communion. And we forget that sometimes. I mean, how often can you say, oh, I got to sit down with 200 people and share in communion. It doesn't happen that often. I definitely can't say, well, I don't know. You get to go to bank sometimes, but it's not that often. I mean, if we get to come together every week, we get to eat a meal and share and break bread. And we do that in remembrance of someone that broke bread with his disciples. And he told us to do the same with each other in remembrance of the things he's done. So let's do that now. Please pray with me. Here in the bottom, we come to the table as imperfect people. We come to the table in hopes that we can be just like Jesus. We come to the table with hands full of things like sin and shame and guilt that help us to drop all of those things so that we can remember your son and the impact that he had on this world us to keep in our minds his sacrifice that he made. God, thank you so much for him and that sacrifice. Sing your son's name great.
Take not your 
Corey and Grace team for leading us in that. Good morning. It's good to be with you all again. It's always a, uh, just a blessing to be together. As Brett said, how often do you get together with 200 people? How often do you get together with people that you deeply love, and people that you're journeying your life together with? And not only that, but people across the state, the country, the world that we are connected to in the body of Christ. So thanks for that reminder and opportunity to be here together today and to share with you. Uh, before we begin, you can go ahead and open up to Psalm 51. We are going to read that entire psalm that we just sang part of. Before we do that, I want to make um, a couple of really exciting announcements. Um, actually, three exciting announcements. The first one to our guest, I want to say a special welcome to you and let you know Hunter Hills 101 is a class that you can learn more about this church and see if this is a place you may want to make your church home. And if you're curious to learn more, we have a class coming up on March 12th, and by class I mean a lunch. We're going to sit around tables together and eat and share the story of this church and get to know one another. Um, and you can RSVP by emailing me, Ryan, at HunterHills.org, right now on your smartphone if you want to, or you can call the church office. We'd love for you to be a part of that, and again, we welcome you here today. And now on to the more exciting news, even. Some of you may know the name Hank Noble, and you may know Hank because that is Al and Jeannie Hogan's son. And uh, some of you, if you're friends with um, with um, Hank's stepdaughter, Candace Berkey, who used to be a member here and her and Stewart have moved up to the Birmingham area, you may have seen on her Instagram feed that uh, Hank was baptized right here in this baptistry last week. I believe it was on Tuesday night. And the entire family got to be here together for that. And not only that, Al, who is young, okay, but 83 years young, got to baptize uh, his, his uh, son. It was a beautiful picture, our son-in-law, beautiful picture that we got to see there. And so we are excited for the Hogan family, excited the family got to be together uh, and to celebrate that. And if you know this family, you know how important that was and how important that was. And there they are. I've been looking for them there. And so can we just celebrate that today? goes to show you, you're never too young nor too old to be used in the kingdom of God right now, and so we are just excited for that, excited for your family, and uh, excited to see the Spirit of God at work. In addition, about two weeks ago, I think it was, or just under two weeks ago, uh, Noah Maddox got baptized. Have we lost him in the room here today? He's gone. He's gone. All right. Well, we were going to invite Noah up front. We may still do that at a later date and pray over him, but Noah Maddox, how old is Noah? Ten. Ten. And uh, the son of Brandon and Jenny Maddox. And so let's celebrate that. He was baptized by the Father. Very excited about that. Um, you know, the days of getting baptized on Sunday morning have faded a little, and that's okay. But we like to celebrate as a family together when people uh, take that next step in their journey of faith. So very excited to see the Spirit of God at work and uh, excited for these families. Thank you all for letting us celebrate that together with you here this morning. Um, if you got your Bible open to Psalm 51, in a moment we're going to read it. And uh, before we do that, if we could, let's just pause here and, and say a prayer, uh, partly in thanksgiving for the good news that we've heard, and partly uh, as we lead into the word of this morning. Would you pray with me? God, we come today in deep praise and thanksgiving to see that you are at work, Lord. And it's easy to go about our weeks, and God, if we're honest, to even forget that you're there, or to go about our weeks and to think that the world seems hopeless, evil seems to be uh, winning the day. But then to hear good news of Noah Maddox and Hank Noble giving their lives to you in, in baptism is such beautiful news to see that your spirit is still at work, that Jesus Christ is still King and Lord. And God, we give you thanks for that today. Thank you for both of these guys giving their lives to you in baptism. I pray your blessings over them and their family as they continue their journey of faith and following Jesus Christ. Give them strength, give them hope, give them faith, Lord. Today, God, as we read this old psalm that David wrote, God, would you let it speak to us here today? Would you let it speak to us of repentance and the glorious good news of forgiveness that we receive in you? And God, would you please pour through me the gift of preaching. In Jesus, we pray. Amen. So, we said last week 
that the Psalms are like a prayer book. The Psalms are the prayer book of Israel, is what they're often called, or the hymn book of Israel. And it would kind of be like, for those of you who are prayer journalers, which I am not much of one, but, but I know prayer journalers, and they write their deepest uh, emotions before God down. Now imagine thousands of years later, people stand up and read your journal to people, and sing your songs to people. That's a bit what the Psalms is like. It's a gift to the community of seeing people wrestle with God and wrestle with faith and they're full of moments that are just full of thanksgiving and praise and exciting times. And then there's moments of weeping. I think of Psalm 137, a psalm of lament where God's people are angry at their enemies. And they want really bad things to happen, not only to their enemies, but to their enemies' babies. And they say it to God. And then I think of moments like we'll see today where I'm almost uncomfortable reading it because this is someone's personal life and their struggles laid out before God. Eugene Peterson said, he said last week that almost every human emotion has been exhausted in the Psalms. And today you get to see this deep emotion of pain and guilt. It's an emotion as I read this Psalm that I have felt at times. And so today, Psalm 51 can be a little bit uncomfortable. Tradition tells us that Psalm 51 was written by David at a specific point in his life, which makes the psalm that much more meaningful, I think, and that much deeper. You can read some psalms separated from the stories that they're a part of, and they still speak and have meaning, but when you read a poem that you know the meaning behind it, it kind of has a deeper feel to it. And that's what Psalm 51 is, because it starts in 2 Samuel chapter 11 with King David... I love the line that says, it was springtime, the time when kings go off to war, and King David stayed behind. Which is always the point, by the way, it seems like, of making bad decisions, is when instead of doing what you ought to be doing, you kind of get lazy and complacent. And so David stays behind, and I don't know exactly the scene, but I picture he's out at night wandering around, the text kind of leads you to think that, and he happens to peer out off of his roof, over to the roof of another home, and there is his neighbor's wife, Bathsheba, bathing in privacy, she believes. And it says that David looked at her, and he liked her, and he hung around there just a little bit too long, and so he sent for Bathsheba to be brought to him, because Bathsheba's husband, Uriah the Hittite, was out fighting wars for David. He was out doing what David ought to be doing. So David sends for Bathsheba, and she comes over and I think it's worth noting just to be reminded that um, not to modernize our text and forget the ancient world that I don't think Bathsheba was so much of a willing partner in this relationship. Just to add to the level of David and his sin here, David's the king and she doesn't have a whole lot of choice, does she? So she comes in to David and says that he sleeps with her and she conceives. Later she sends word back that I'm pregnant. So David does what a I'm almost all of us do when we're caught in sin immediately. Well, I can fix this. I can hide this. I can cover this up. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to bring Uriah home, and I'm going to send him into his wife, and he'll stay with her, and then this will cover any, any mess I may have made here. But it turns out Uriah's got a bit more integrity than David, and so Uriah refuses to go and be with his family and be with his wife while his brothers are out of war. So now David's panicking a little bit. All right, here's another plan. What if I get him drunk? Then surely he'll go in and lay with his wife and everything will be solved. And even when he's drunk, he's a better man than David, it appears, in this moment. Because Uriah still is true to his brothers and won't do it. So David goes to the extreme now, and he packs up a note. And this creeps me out a little because if I understand it correctly, he sends the note with Uriah to the commander in the field that says, put this man at the front of battle, and when the moment's right, pull away so that he'll be killed. And the commander does exactly as he's told. Uriah the Hittite dies on the front lines of battle. David then goes and takes Uriah's wife, Bathsheba, brings her into his own, and it looks like all along this was okay. No one will know now of his great sin. And so David moves along. I don't know what the time distance is, but we know she's um, I think she's still pregnant at this point, when a prophet named Nathan comes along. And I wouldn't want Nathan's job, by the way, because Nathan's been sent to call out the king of Israel for his sin. So Nathan tells a little story. Hey, David, there's a rich man. 
and there's a poor man. And the poor man has this one little lamb that he deeply loves. It's not your average lamb. This lamb is like dogs to us. This lamb goes where he goes and hangs out with him. This lamb even sleeps with him. This is his friend. This is like a child to him. And here's the rich man who's got all the lambs in the world he can want. And he's having a little party. So he takes the poor man's lamb and he kills it and feeds it to his friends. And David, like all good self-righteous hypocrites, rages in anger and says, this man should be killed. This man should be punished. I don't remember the exact wording, but he's very upset with the rich man. And one of the most iconic lines in scripture, Nathan says, you're the man. Not in the way we said it in the 90s, but in the convicting sort of way. You are that man, David. So David has a Nathan moment, is what I call it. He's brought to his knees over the weight and the guilt of his sin. He had known all along he had done wrong, but for some reason in this moment, it smacks him in the face when he sees it in the life of another that I'm that same man. In fact, I'm worse, because it wasn't a lamb that I took, it was a man's wife, and then I took that old man's life. And it's out of that story and out of that world that David writes these words. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you were right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins. Blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your way so that sinners will turn back to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O oh God, you who are God my Savior. And my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O oh God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. You, God, will not despise. May it please you to prosper Zion, to build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in the sacrifices of the righteous and burnt offerings offered whole. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. Man, those are heavy words. Those are intimate words. Again, I almost feel uncomfortable reading them. I feel like I've stumbled on someone's diary and started reading it aloud to people. Especially when you know the story was at play here. And as a side note, I'm not sure if David wrote it expecting people to keep reading it. But it's been a gift to the faith community for years and years to remind us of who God is. Psalm 1 reminded us last week that there's two ways you can go about doing life. There's one way that the wicked take that leads to death. There's a way of selfishness. There's a way of greed. There's a way of unrighteousness. There's a way to live that makes you the center of the universe that would be defined as wickedness that leads to death. But then there's this other way that leads to life that makes us, as we said, like trees planted by streams of water. This way of following after and loving God and His law, of loving Him and loving your neighbor as yourself. And no, it doesn't guarantee a perfectly good life, but it leads to life. It leads us on the path to life. And so a question we may have is what happens when you find yourself wandering down that other path, as many of us so often do? 
And I myself have been down this path before on many occasions, and I'm sure at some point in my life we'll go down the path again where you wake up and realize you're on the wrong road. So what happens in those moments when you're like a king that doesn't go to war? And you start to get complacent, and you start meddling around in things you shouldn't do. And you start covering it up, and you start pushing it to the side. What happens in those days, and I find myself working like King David here, because I can fix it. <coughs> Turns out I am king of my own life, and I can fix these problems, and I can cover them up, or I can handle it, it's going to be okay. Or my favorite thing to do is what David says in the Psalms, is bring my sacrifices. I'll sing more songs. I'll go to more church services. I will volunteer more. I will do more for the kingdom than therefore numb the sin in my life and pretend it's not there. And so these are ways that I often approach these things. And sometimes, if I'm really honest, I do that because I don't want to face directly my sin because I like it. There's a reason that we worship idols and it's because we start to like it. We start to move that way. We start to think that these sins can bring us life, but they promise us something. And so I don't want to deal with it because I don't really want to let go of it if I'm honest. And sometimes, and this has often been the case in my life, it's because I am scared to face God and confess my sin to Him. Because the picture of God that was given to me is a God who really doesn't like me that much anyways. And this just adds fuel to his fire of how messed up I am. And the last thing I want to do is come before God and tell him the sin that's in my life. Even though I know he already knows. Even though I know that while I was still a sinner, Christ died for me. I don't want to deal with it. I worry about what his response might be. And this is why I love Psalm 51, because it's a peak into an intimate relationship of humanity and God. If I were to ask you, name one person in the Bible that you think had a phenomenal relationship with God that you want to watch and study and see. Let's take Jesus out of the picture. Probably most of us say David. I mean, he's described in the very beginning of his story as a man who's pursuing after God's own heart. He's a man who looks faithful, who defeats Goliath, who leads Israel. He's the guy I want to know about his relationship with God. In fact, if I look at Psalms, he wrote a good chunk of them. And so this is the guy that I want to study. This is the guy that I want to look at. And so when I read Psalm 51, we are reading David's prayer diary. Therefore, we are looking at an intimate relationship between humanity and God. And therefore... But we learn a little something about God. The Psalms aren't necessarily full of doctrine per se, because it's a lot of poetry there. I'm not even sure if I agree with everything David said about theology in Psalm 51, but it's a poem that he's writing. It's his diary he's writing. And he's real and he's raw with God, and he says, God, my sin is always before you. I've been rebellious. I've got blood on my hands. I'm weighed down by guilt. And he just lays it all out here before God, which is something I'm not always keen on doing. Because again, I'm not convinced of the God that I'm speaking to. Will he forgive me? Will he love me continually? Has he given up on me? And so I've had these moments like David where I've either been brought to my knees in sin or I need to be brought to my knees in sin, but in the back of my mind, I wonder if God's good enough. I wonder if God is gracious enough. I wonder if God is loving enough. Which is why Psalm 51 is so important because it corrects my miscalculations of who God is. It corrects my bad theology. It corrects my notions of who God is. And so I think it's worth noting and reminding us this morning that Psalm 51, we are not peeking into the scene of a courtroom. With a judge, and a jury, and a lawyer. We're looking at a relationship. We're looking at a father and a son here. And David is not repenting to make a case to get out of jail free, which is what repentance in our judicial system looks like. That's how we think of forgiveness and repentance. It's a plea deal with the jury. If I confess my sin here, maybe I'll get off a little easier. So God, if I just tell you what I did... 
And maybe you'll lighten up your sentence a little bit. But again, this is not a courtroom scene. This is not David trying to get out of jail. Repentance in the context of relationship is about being set right. Repentance in the context of relationship is about being made whole. Restoring you and the relationship to what it was always intended to be, to being set free. And it's not that God doesn't get angry about sin. God certainly gets angry about sin, but he's not an irrational two-year-old who's mad because somebody took his toy. He gets angry at sin because he sees the destruction that it does to his people, to his children. Just like when I look out at my kids yesterday when George dropped his heel right into Henry's face in anger in a wrestling match. It was supposed to be fun. It makes me angry. I'm not angry at George. I don't want to destroy George, but I know this is not the way life is meant to be. This is not the way you were created to be. So God looks at sin and he gets angry because he's a loving creator who sees his children destroying themselves. I like what N.T. Wright here says, when God looks at sin, what he sees is what a violin maker would see. It's a player where he used his lovely creation as a tennis racket. It's the same thing when we see our kids and we see these hands that were created to serve and to love, to love God, to love neighbor, and they use these hands to strike brothers and sisters, and it makes you angry because that's not what you're made for. So it's not that God demands repentance because it's the only way to get you out of jail. God demands repentance because he deeply loves each of us and longs for us to be restored to relationship with him. Now I know the Bible is full of imagery that has this courtroom kind of sound and God is judge. We know that that analogy is there, but overwhelmingly God is father to his children. God in the Old Testament is described as a mother, a midwife. God is described as father, someone who's bringing life, who nourishes life, who deeply loves his children. Go read Hosea. When Israel gets off path, God is angry and the text is there, but then he breaks out like a father holding his baby and weeping. He says, I just long to hold you to my cheek. I'm angry because there's so much better for your life than it could be. And God demands repentance out of love because he longs for us to be restored to right relationship with him and with one another. I think about when I wronged Sarah in our marriage the once or twice that I've done that. <laughs> Why are you all laughing? <laughs> okay, once or twice a day. I've done it a time or two. I've done things that weren't right and weren't fair to her and hurt her. And she, in a way, she wouldn't say this, but she demands repentance. I would demand, we, we demand repentance in a relationship. Not because she wants to see me hurt and suffer, right? I hope. <laughs> Not because she's going to kill me if I don't, I hope. But because we long for our relationship to be restored to what it's meant to be, to this covenant marriage relationship. And it can't happen without repentance. And that's why David calls us to repentance by sharing his story with us. And as long as I don't repent of what I've done in my marriage... Our relationship can't be because I'm not allowing it to. And as long as I refuse to repent of the sin in my life to God, our relationship can't be. And that's what deeply moves God because he loves me and he loves you and he loves the world he created and he longs to be in relationship with that world. And so Psalm 51 is not a scene of law and order. This isn't a courtroom scene. This is a father and a son wrestling through the relationship. And it demands an answer. What happens as a result of Psalm 51? David is crying out for his heart to be cleansed. He's crying out for guilt to be removed. He's crying out for forgiveness. And if it just ends there, well, it could be a sad story because we wouldn't know what happened. And of course we do because we know the story of David. David goes on. He has consequences because of his sin. The child that is conceived dies. His own family goes on to be at war with one another. He has issues with his kids all along. But ultimately, David continues to lead God's people. David continues to be a leader of Israel. And through David, we know the Messiah comes in the city of Bethlehem. 
the town of David. David gets restored back and he gets to continue living into the mission that God has called him to. It's like if the violin maker sees you play in tennis with the violin, maybe he'll teach you to play it instead. God keeps teaching David to play the music he created him to play in his life. So that's one answer that David goes on to live and he goes on to be used for God's kingdom purposes. And many of us here today are afraid to pray Psalm 51 because we're unsure about the one to whom we are praying and what his answer might be. And if David's story is not enough for you, I think the answer to Psalm 51 is Jesus Christ on a cross. When evil humanity has been poured out upon him and the very people who crucified him and put him on a cross, he looks on and says, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And I used to read that and think, okay, there's Jesus trying to convince God to be forgiving. But the reality is, Scripture tells us, even all throughout the Old Testament, God is a forgiving God. And when Jesus looks on and says, Father, forgive them, he's not convincing God that contrary to who God is, he's revealing to us who God is. A God who longs to forgive. A God who wants to relent from calamity and punishment and longs for loving relationship with his people. A God who longs to see people restored. A God who Psalm 34 says, if we were to read it, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and save those who are crushed in spirit. So Psalm 51 started with a nascent moment, a prophet who would come and say what needed to be said to bring David to account for his sin so that he could be restored to God. And I've had many Nathan moments in my life as I look back on it. One of them came in my early 20s. It was about 10 years ago. And I went to a church service one day that I thought was just going to be kind of you know, an average church service. The preacher was out of town and we had some guest speaker in the audience who I just thought was some redneck from Pickham, South Carolina, wherever he was from. And I say that jokingly because I know and love this man. His name is Brett Broyles, and he gets up to share a sermon, and he walks up on stage, um, you know, shirt tail untucked, his jeans on, and two five-gallon buckets. And I thought, might have been a good day to stay home, but I'm here. He comes in, he sets these buckets down, and he starts talking about the junk that we carry in our buckets. And we keep toting them around, they keep weighing us down, but we hold on to them because we don't believe God will forgive us, because we don't believe anybody could carry these burdens with us. And I'm telling you, this guy who would call himself some old redneck from Backwood, South Carolina, gave one of the best sermons I've ever heard. And he talks about when he was 13 years old, all of his friends got a sip of whiskey, and all of them coughed and spit. And from that day on, as soon as he tasted it, he said it was warm to him and he loved it. And started him on a journey of alcoholism that blossomed as an adult. And he talks about coming to the realization of how this was an a, um, idol in his life. He'd become a slave to this. And I'm sitting out there in the audience in my early 20s knowing that I got sent in my own life that I was carrying that day. And I started fighting back tears. That was a Nathan moment for me. Because I needed to be woken up to the sin that was in my life. And I needed to have the opportunity to confess it. But I was scared because what if the people around me think differently of me? What if God's really not that good? What if he wouldn't forgive me? And Brett woke me up and reminded me that day that God is that good. That God longs to create new life. That he longs to make new things. He longs to take what is old and make it new. He longs to take what is ugly and make it beautiful. This is who God is. This is who David says God is. From his experience of wrestling with this mysterious God at the core, he is a loving God who is faithful who loves his people and longs to see them restored. And so it doesn't seem like a fun moment to have Nathan moments because there's a little bit of pain in the process, but oh, the joy, as David would say, of being restored to God's salvation. Oh, the joy of being reminded that you were loved by God. Oh, the joy of stop carrying your five-gallon buckets, but to put them down and let some people carry these sins with you. Joy of being set free and being set right and being who God created you to be. 
So for you today, maybe today is a negative moment. That God wakes us up to the sin that's in our life. And that doesn't sound like good news. But the good news is, you're just fitting in better with all the sinners in this room here, myself included. Eugene Peterson says, the crazy thing about church is, the scary thing, if you look in, it's full of sinners, and worst of all, they have one as their preacher too. We're all sinners. But some of us today have found ourselves wandering down that path, and we may not even realize it. But if we look at ourselves and we look introspectively, if we listen to a voice like Nathan, we might realize that, well, greed is an idol in my life. And I keep buying and wanting more. My checking account is way out of whack because I'm trying to fill some hole in my life by buying stuff. We may look around and realize all the sin that we carry. For some of us, it's Alcohol. For some of us, it's pornography, it's lust. It's a relationship we're in that we shouldn't be in. It's betrayal. It's gossip. It could be anything. We always pick on the big sins in the church. But it could be any sin that we carry that pulls us off track and is pulling us away from God, who God intended us to be and what we need is a Nathan moment to wake us up to our sin. And maybe today could be good news because it's a Nathan moment. And the good news is you don't bear it alone. But you have a community of God's people who are all sinful people who want to walk with you and journey with you. And the joy of confessing sin and getting it off and getting the guilt out of the way. Again, not so that you can get out of jail, but so that you can be free to be who God made you to be. So you can quit playing tennis with a violin. Start playing the beautiful music God made you for. So I would like to invite us all to stand and invite our praise team back up. We're going to sing here. This may be a record, but two weeks in a row, we're just going to do an altar call again, all right? And I'm looking out here again at Keith and Barry, and I want to invite all of our shepherds. If I get Keith and Barry to come back up at the front where you were last week, and every shepherd in this room, Randy, if, if you would be on the side over there, somebody's probably over this way that could, could be available. We're going to sing a song, and I want to give you an opportunity to... Come and pray. Maybe you have sin that you want to confess to the church. And I'm going to tell you even about these elders and tell you a secret about them. They're not perfect either. Which makes them the perfect people to embrace you and pray with you this morning and love on you. We're not going to air it all out to the church between you and them. I'll be up here if you want to talk to me. And then I know there's a handful of people who are just carrying weight in life. Life has a way of happening, doesn't it? And last week you wanted to pray with the shepherd, but you didn't for some reason. And maybe today you want to come and let them lay their hands upon you. James says, those who are sick, come and let the shepherds pray on them. And I think that's about physical sickness, but more than that, I think it's about spiritual sickness. It's about life happening. It's about difficulties in your journey. Come and let the elders lay hands on you, weep with you, pray with you today. Maybe you need to pray Psalm 51 with these guys. Create in me a clean heart, God. And if you hear nothing else today, hear this. You don't repent and confess sin to make God love you. You repent and confess sin because God deeply loves you. And he wants you to be who he made you to be. So if you have anything today that you want to bring forward, if you would come here in the song, let me pray for us. God, today, we confess to you that every one of us in this room are sinful people. And God, for some of us, we've gotten deeper into stuff than we realize, and today has been a moment that wakes us up. But God, let it be good news that we are set free. We may have consequences that we live with, but we get to be restored to right relationship with you. God, there are people in this room who are hurting, people in this room who are carrying sicknesses, who are carrying family problems. We have teenagers that are rebelling and they don't know how to handle these situations. There are people in this room, God, who are struggling with doubt. God, today, let us realize we don't struggle alone, but we have people that walk with us. And God, let us use this time today to pray together. Thank you for the good news of Jesus Christ. Thank you for Psalm 51 that reminds us that you long to forgive us. In Jesus we pray. Amen.
Oh, oh. 